over the last several weeks, Pastor Don has been talking with us uh, through a series that he called the Original Christmas Playlist. And he talked to us about how each of these people that originally spoke the scripture had a song in their hearts about the Lord and the coming of the Christ in the end of the season. And so, uh, back some time ago, actually back in November, uh, Pastor Todd, when he first got here, uh, I had gotten out of the hospital and I was at home and we were staying in close contact and he was sending me. Facebook messages and email messages and phone calls and came out my house and, and uh, we talked about a lot of different things. He, he called me up one day and he said, would this be a good time to come over and, and visit with him? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, I'll be over in a little while. And he said, get rested up because I have lots of questions for you. We spent about two and a half hours that day talking and, uh, and sharing some things together. And he was asking me all kinds of questions about the church. And, um, and he was saying as he was looking out ahead where he wanted to go, and, and he told me about this series of messages that he was going to preach. I didn't know where he was going with it, uh, but he said, um, uh, I'm going to be gone the first Sunday in January, and he said, I'd like for you to speak that Sunday, and so uh, if you just uh, prepare for that, um, uh, that, I'd appreciate that. And so I began to... to uh, Read and uh, I am going through the book of Luke, and uh, I I said, you know, it's funny that you should ask right now because I said I was reading in the book of Luke, and I said this one particular scripture just kind of popped at me when I read it, and I said I think I'll go in that direction. I think I'll plan a message in that direction, and so uh, he said okay, and, and he begins putting together his series of messages and. Uh, and that first Sunday when he got up and said he was going to preach uh, the original Christmas playlist and he was going to go through the Advent season and talk about each of these different uh, songs and he named the people that he was going to be talking about. He talked about Mary and the angels and the shepherds and Zacharias and he ended with Simeon. I just got a grin on my face because in the book of Luke where I was reading, um, I read about Simeon, and then the very next person that came after Simeon was a lady named Anna, and that's where I was reading when I told him that this message had just popped, that I just seen something like this that just stuck out to me, and that I wanted to share with the church, and so he took us through Simeon, and I'm going to pick up this morning with the Song of Anna in Luke chapter 2. So turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 2. I'll just be reading two verses this morning, verses 36 through 38. And it says this, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to picture in your mind, we have this lady named Anna. And all we know about her is found in two verses, verses 36 to 37. There's no history anywhere else of her in Scripture. All we know is what is given here in these verses. And these verses tell us a boatload about Anna. And I want us to examine Anna's life and see what we can get out of it for ourselves and see the challenge that it might give us. And so I found three things in this verse, in these two verses about Hannah that I think are real important for us to look at, and I think that we can put these into practice in our own life, and we can see God using us just as he did Anna. The first thing that I read there was that Anna was 84 years old at the time. 
that these things happened and that this was written about her. I'm getting some signals that some folks can't hear me back there. I don't know if, the, if you can come up some of the sound. But Anna was 84 years old. And sometimes the older we get, the more we think that we are useless. The more we think we have nothing to add to the conversation. Uh, I was uh, talking to somebody the other day, and they were uh, talking about ministry things, and, and they were talking about uh, uh, things that we could do for God, and and uh, and I kind of, to tell you the truth, was feeling a little sorry for myself, and I wasn't feeling well in my body. I, I, I was worn out, and I was tired, and I was aching, and I, and I said, you know, I'm 58 years old. I'm not really starting any new things. I'm not really doing anything exciting anymore. And and and, and I, I've got all these different physical things going on. And 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 I'm 58 years old. Who's looking for an old 58 year old man? And I read about Anna, and it says she was 84 years old. 84, and she had been a widow. She she got married and, and it was not uncommon in that day for them to get married at 14 years old or 15 years old. And, and she had been married for seven years and her husband dies. And then from uh, the time that her husband dies, she has lived until she's 84 years old as a widow. And the scripture tells us that she was in the temple night and dead. And it said she was faithful. Let me read to you there, verse 37. The first part says, she never left the temple serving night and day. This lady was a faithful lady, and she was 84 years old. I keep repeating that because I want you to get it into your mind that age doesn't really mean anything as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. In the world, people will not choose you because of different things. But in the kingdom of God, God has a use for you no matter who you are, no matter what your talents or abilities are, no matter what your age is. And this woman was faithful, and it said that she served night and day, never leaving the temple. Now, I went and I read in a bunch of commentaries about that, and some of them said that she may have lived in an apartment within the temple and that she served in different capacities there. Others said that this was just kind of a generalization and it meant that uh, it didn't mean that she actually never left the, the building of the temple, but it meant that she <coughs> was always available and that she was always doing something. And I want to ask you a question. What are you doing for the Lord? What are you finding that you can do to serve the Lord? What are you finding to use your talents and your abilities for? Uh, as I was telling you that it, it, uh, it, it excited me that the Lord had given me a message from the person that was right after the last person that Brother uh, Todd was going to preach about. It, it also excited me on Wednesday night when we had our lesson and we were talking about talents and abilities and things that we can do for God. And Pastor Todd was encouraging people and he said, he said the, uh, the, the great commandment is uh, you know, a thing that we ought to remember, and that's something that ought to be forefront in the mind of the Christian. And the, the Lord tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them and baptizing them, and, and that every one of us has that commission that we're supposed to go forth and we're supposed to be serving the Lord. But then he began to talk about talents, and, and I was getting all excited on a Wednesday night Bible study, and I was, I was. I had a big grin on my face, and after the after the Bible study was over, I went to Pastor Todd, and I said, I almost shouted, uh, remember this for Sunday, remember that verse for Sunday, because those were the same verses, the same ideas that I had been thinking. 
taken by in preparing this message. That every one of us has given, been given talents and abilities by God. And God wants us to be faithful in using those talents and abilities for God. And so often we look around us and we say, well, somebody can speak better than I can speak. When I, we say, somebody can teach better than I can teach. When I walked out of Sunday school, class this morning. I was thinking, anybody can teach better than I can teach. I, I felt like I didn't do a good job this morning getting my point across and, and bringing out what I had, I had written a bunch of notes, but I felt like I wasn't good at that. And so sometimes we think, well, somebody else can do that better than I can, and somebody else can do that better than I can. And we, and we start to look at all the things that we can't do, and there's so much that we can do that we won't. But this scripture says that Anna was faithful, never leaving the temple day or night. She constantly was finding something to do for the Lord. She was constantly finding a way to make her life useful for the things of God. She found ways. There were things that she could do. There were ways that she could serve. Now, in that day, women were not considered in very high esteem. And I don't know what she did. The, the scripture tells us that she was a prophetess. And the commentators went back and forth on that too. Because there are different meanings of that word prophecy. One, one meaning of the word prophecy is foretelling the future. And there were some that said, Anna likely was not foretelling the future, but the other interpretation of the word prophecy is somebody who is proclaiming the word of God. And so I don't claim to be a prophet that can tell the future. Uh, I, I don't even know what's going to happen today. But I'm one who proclaims the word of God. I'm one that gets up and preaches the word of God. I'm one that shares the word of God with people. And so in that sense, I'm a prophet. And Anna, it said, was a prophetess. And she was able to teach people about the things of God. She used her knowledge. She used her abilities. Some of you are, are teachers. I, I thought about uh, Susie Friedman and how Susie Friedman had been a teacher for years. And, and then uh, at our Christmas Eve service, as she was up here teaching the children and reading them a story about Christmas and sharing with them. And I, I wondered if that took her back to her teaching years. And, and, uh, and, and I thought that was such a wonderful part of our service. Some of you have abilities where you could be teaching others about the things of God. Some of you are able to do things manually with your hand, and, and, and maybe uh, you can't uh, uh, be a Sunday school teacher, or maybe you don't feel called to be up preaching in front of people, but you could use those mechanical abilities in a way that you could reach out to somebody for Jesus. You can touch somebody's life for the Lord. You find out somebody's got a car that's broken down, and you go and you begin to work on that car, and you begin to help them with that need. And, and as you're working on their car, you can talk to them about Jesus, and you can tell them about the Lord. And, and some of you ladies are good at baking, and you can bake pies and cakes and things, and, and you can take them to people and bless them, those that are sick or those that are maybe lonely and don't have any visitors. You can go and you can share your talents and your abilities with them. Some of you are good at bookkeeping and there are people that don't know how to file their taxes and, and you can uh, sit down with them and take them through that process and you say, none of this stuff is religious. That's right, none of it's religious. But you can use what you have to make it an opportunity to share the love of God with somebody. You can be faithful in what God has given you the, ability, the abilities and the talents that the Lord has given you, you can use for the kingdom of God. The scripture tells us that not all are teachers. Not all are preachers. Not all are evangelists. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all have the same talents or abilities. But we do all have something that we can do to be busy about the Father's business. Busy in the kingdom of God. 
busy touching lives just as Anna touched lives. And she told people about the Lord. In uh, 1 Corinthians, it says, Moreover, it is required of students that they be found faithful. And Anna was faithful. She was there all the time, day and night, looking for something to do, not waiting for somebody else to do the job. She was there doing what she could do for the Lord. What could you do for the Lord? How could you be busy about the Father's business? What talents do you have that you could use to touch somebody else's life? You could just be an encourager. You know, you could be the person that sends a card or, or makes a phone call or makes a visit or volunteers to babysit or, or have, goes to the grocery store for somebody that needs it. There are all kinds of ways that every one of you can be busy for the Lord, doing something, being faithful to the work of God, teaching other people how to serve the Lord. And then the scripture says that she fasted and prayed. She fasted and prayed. Now, it was the custom of the Pharisees in that time to fast twice a week. And generally, their fasting would go from 6 o'clock one night until 6 o'clock the next night. And they would go without food. And uh, remember the Pharisee that came into the temple and there was a a sinner that came into the temple at the same time, and one was praying one way, and one was praying another. The, the sinner prayed and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he realized how undone he was before the Lord. He realized his need for God. And the Pharisee came in and said, Lord, I thank you I'm not like that man. I go to the temple, and I fast twice a week, and I give alms of all that I have. I pay my tithe. And he was so proud, saying what a great job he was doing. The other man was humbling himself before the Lord. But it was it was one of those customs that the, that the Pharisees had, where they would fast twice a week. And, and some of the readings that I went through said that, that they would usually fast on Tuesdays and on Thursdays. And so they would go from 6 o'clock the night before until 6 o'clock that day, not having anything to eat. And they would spend time maybe doing some good deed, or they would spend time uh, studying the Word of God, or they would spend time in prayer. But they, they would <coughs> set themselves aside from the things that were comfortable, from the things that felt good, from the things that tasted good. They would, they would uh, take themselves away from those things. And it says that Anna fasted and prayed. She took time to step away from the table. She took time to, to say, I, I'd really like to have that meal, but it's more important that I spend time with God. It's more important that I study the word. It's more important that I spend time in prayer. And so she pushed herself away. We don't hear much about fasting anymore. We always talk about prayer. But very rarely do we talk about fasting. And I thought about how Jesus uh, uh, was asked, uh, his disciples were asked, to heal a young boy, and they were not able to heal him. And the father comes to Jesus and said, I brought my son to your disciples, but they weren't able to heal him. And Jesus said, this kind of comes out not, but by prayer and fasting. Fasting is when uh, sometimes it's done because we realize we've sinned against God, and we're so grieved over our sin that we'll push ourselves away from the table and say, Lord, I won't eat, I want to pray, and I want to seek you, and I want your forgiveness. And other times, it's recognizing the greatness of God, and we lift him up, and we, we step away from the, the earthly provisions in order that we might focus ourselves on the one who gives us all provisions that we need, spiritual 
and physical. And then there are times where we're just humbling ourselves before God and we're saying, Lord, I realize who you are and I just want to separate myself from these things of comfort, these things that I like, these things that I take in all the time. I want to just separate myself from those things. Before I went to India, the first time back in 2004, I did something I had never done before. I did a 40-day fast. And I, there are times when you're doing a fast when you're going, what am I doing this for? I don't feel any different. I don't feel any spiritual superpower. I don't feel like anything is really happening. And, and as I was going through that fast, I had one lady that just thought I was a fool to fast for 40 days. And she said, it's not healthy to fast for 40 days. I said, well, that's okay. The Lord can take care of me. And, and uh, getting towards the end of the fast, I was very weak. Now, when we read about Moses fasting, he's up in a mountain by himself, and we don't read that he was doing a lot of physical labor and all that kind of thing. And, um, and, and so I don't know whether Moses just kind of laid around fasting and praying, but I was doing it in my everyday activity. And I was fasting, but I was working and I was doing all kinds of stuff and, and uh, <coughs> it began to take its toll on me. And towards the end of the fast, I was very weak and I was having a hard time staying energetic about anything. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm still getting over the last traces of this virus. And, uh, and <coughs> And I was sitting in the narthex of the church, and this lady came down, and I started to get up out of the chair to greet her. And I was just too weak, and I sat back down, and I said, I'll shake your hand from here. And she said, I don't know why you're doing this. And I said, well, <coughs> I just feel it's important to get ready to go on this mission trip, and I feel it's important to fast and pray. And she said, well, the Lord gives us some common sense, too. And she said this in front of a whole crowd of people. And I was a little embarrassed. And, and I said, well, I just felt something I needed to do. And I went on that trip to India, and I didn't think anything about it. And I get there, and the first night I preach, a mother brought a daughter to me that had this incredible thing going on in her body. And I laid hands on that girl, prayed for her, and she was instantly healed. And the next day, a little boy broke his arm while I was preaching. The little boy was playing way in the back and broke his arm while I was preaching. And, uh, and the father brought him to me after the service. It was the nastiest break I had ever seen in my life. The, the bone was broken and it was kind of sticking up out of the skin like this and it was horrible. And they brought the boy to me and said, the father wants you to pray for him. And in my head, I'm thinking, this kid needs a hospital. He doesn't need me. And I laid my hands on that little boy and I said, God, I can't do anything for this boy. This father is expecting something and I don't have any power to heal him, but you have power to heal him. And the next day, <coughs> we went to a village and that little boy was healed. And I asked the father about the little boy and he called him out and the little boy came running as fast as he could and his arms were just flailing like this and I, and I asked him, I said, ask him how his arm is. And the little boy went like this and started waving his arm around that had just been horribly broken the day before. You may think I'm crazy, but I saw it happen. And over and over and over again through that trip, God used me in miraculous ways to bring healing to people. I had never claimed to have the gift of healing, and I don't to this day. I, I wish that I did, and I, and I ask the Lord at times to give me the gift of healing. And I go to hospitals, and I pray for people, and I want them to be instantly healed. But God did something miraculous on that trip. And over and over and over again, we saw miracles like that. I was telling my Sunday school class, uh, using an example this morning of a woman that was in India that was demon-possessed. 
And as I prayed for her, I saw her delivered from demon possession over and over again, miracle after miracle. And I, and, and I was asked to stay longer on that trip because so many things were happening. And I stayed an extra week and we just saw God do some miraculous things. And when I came back, I was like, wow, what, what, that was something. I've never seen God work like that before. And then I thought about how I spent 40 days separating myself from comforts, separating myself from things that I enjoy, and seeking God's will. I need to do some more fasting. And you need to do some fasting too. The scripture tells us it's something that we ought to do. The, the, the people came to Jesus one time and they said, how come, you know, John the Baptist fasted, but you don't, your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said that they would fast after he left. Thank you. Jesus said that they would fast after he left, that you don't fast while the bridegroom's there, but when the bridegroom leaves, you fast. And so after Jesus left, his disciples began to fast and pray, and they began to see the Lord doing great things in their lives. They began to see the miraculous work of God going forward, and we need to discipline ourselves. There's times when we need to say, Lord, I'm going to step away from the table. Lord, I'm not going to eat that thing that I wanted to eat. Lord, I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to spend time seeking you, and I'm going to give you with my whole heart all my energy so that you can use me. And if we would fast and pray, we would see God working in our lives in more miraculous ways. We would see the power of God more than what we do. She was 84 years old and she fasted and prayed. And I, I had a lady in my congregation in West Virginia, and I went to visit her one day. She had been a pastor's wife for many years, and her husband had died many years before I met her. And I went to her house, and we were we got to talking, and I could tell she was kind of down. She wasn't uh, wasn't her normal cheerful self. And I asked her what was the matter, and she said, "You know, I just feel useless." I said, why is that? And she said, well, my husband pastored for these years, and she said, I was there right with him working along in the ministry, and she said, I, I taught, and, and she said, I prayed with people, and she said, I, I uh, taught children in church, and she said, I did all kinds of things in the church, and she said, now my husband's gone, and she said, now I'm up in my 80s, and she said, I'm just useless. There's nothing I can do but pray. I, I began to laugh. And I said, Sister, you are doing the most important thing. I need somebody just like you that will pray and seek God and ask the Lord to help your pastor as he's preaching and as he's teaching and as he's ministering. Ask the Lord to bless the work of the church. Ask the Lord to change the hearts of hard hearted people. I, I need somebody like you who'll be a prayer warrior. And she said, that's all I can do is pray. And I said, that's the most important thing you can do. And here was Anna the prophetess. And at 84 years old, she spent time praying and seeking the Lord. You know, we need to pray. If you're like me, you do everything else before you pray. When things go wrong, you worry about them. You fret about them, you talk about them, you post them on Facebook, you get shook up over them, and then finally, when it seems like all else has failed, you pray. We need to pray. We need to seek the Lord. The Lord is our loving Father, and He wants to have a relationship with us. How many of you that have kids like it when your kids just come to you when they need money? 
You like it when they call you. You like it when they visit you. You like it when they think about you and send you a card. You like it when they send you an email and you know they're thinking about you. I like it when I get a text message and it has a little cartoon and it, and it, and it says, I love you, or I'm thinking about you, or, or uh, you're on my mind today. I love it when I walk in my office. If you walk in my office, uh, Walk in the door, turn immediately to the right, and there's a, a whiteboard there. And there's a little nook in the corner of that board, and it says, I heart you. And then it says, P H A. Thug. That stands for Hannah Thug. So. And that little note she wrote me about 15 years ago. If I catch any of you trying to erase that little note off that whiteboard, we will have a serious problem. <laughs> I love that little note on that whiteboard. My daughter, one time when we were in West Virginia, we had just gotten there and I had just bought that whiteboard and I put it up on the wall in my office and my daughter came to visit for a weekend and after the sermon was over and she was going to be leaving that afternoon, she snuck in my office and she wrote, I heart you, thug. Because that's my nickname for her. I call her that all the time. When she was a little girl, I'd say, hey, thug, come here. And she'd go, no, call me thug, daddy. And now she uses it as a name of endearment. And she wrote that little message on the board letting me know that she loves me. Sometimes, after she's been here, I'll be writing something on a post-it note, and I'll pull off the next note on the post-it note pad, and I'll find where she snuck over and went through the pad and wrote me little notes that says, such and such date, Daddy, I love you. And there'll be these little notes hanging around. Here a while back, I stopped at the hospital, and I went into my console in the center of my car, and I grabbed a little notebook out of there because I wanted to write something down that I was thinking of at the time, and I flipped that little notebook open, and I found a note that she had written there probably two or three years ago, and I just found it recently, and it let me know that she loves me. Don't you love it when you hear from your kids? Don't you love it when they tell you how much they love you? Don't you love it when they're communicating with you? God loves us. And he loves to hear from us. And he doesn't only want to hear from us when we've gotten ourselves into trouble and we're going and saying, get us out of this now, God. But he's wanting us to come to him and talk to him and share our hearts with him and to listen to him. Hannah fasted and prayed. She spent time with the Lord. And that's what the Lord wants us to do, to spend time with him and talk to him. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says these three words, pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Always talk to the Lord. In any circumstance, you feel sad, tell the Lord about it. You feel depressed, tell the Lord about it. You feel anxious, talk to the Lord about it. You're upset about something, tell Jesus. You don't know what to do, ask the Lord for help. Spend time with the Lord. He loves to hear from you. And he wants to know how you're feeling. He knows it already, but he wants to hear it from you. And Anna spent time in prayer. And then it tells us that this is the part that really popped out to me when I was studying. It says she told everybody about Jesus. In verse 38 there it says, at that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continue to speak of him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. You know what that means? It says she, she told everybody that was looking for the redemption in Jerusalem. 
Who was looking for redemption in Jerusalem? All of the Jews were. They were all waiting for the Messiah to come. They were all looking for how the scripture was being fulfilled. They were all waiting for somebody to say, this is the Messiah. This is the one that was promised. This is the one that the prophets had talked about. And so Anna began to tell people about Jesus. When she saw Jesus, uh, Pastor Todd told us about Zacharias and Simeon and the coming of the Lord and how they were waiting for him. And Simeon, when he saw the Lord, he said, I can die in peace now. I've seen the Messiah. I've seen the one that was promised. And Anna comes in and she sees the Lord and she begins to rejoice. She begins to thank God for answering his promise and, and, and keeping his word. And, and she's so thrilled that this is the Messiah that has come. And it says she continued to tell everyone about Jesus. I have a question for you. When was the last time you spoke to anybody about Jesus? I know you talk about sports. I know you talk about the weather. I know you talk about your health. I talk about all those things too, except for sports. I've never been, been that much of a sports fan, but uh, I, I did. I saw something on the news this week about one team, and I wanted to give Smitty a hard time, but I didn't. But um, we all have things that we love to talk about. We all have things of interest to us that we just we can't wait to share it with somebody else. And, and, and we, you know, we get together and say, did you see what happened on the news today? Did you hear what this politician did? Did you see what this decision that was made? Did you hear about this new car that came out? Did you do that? You know, we talk about everything. When was the last time we talked about Jesus? When was the last time you told somebody about how good he has been to you? When was the last time you shared with somebody about what God has done? When was the last time you shared with somebody about why you have faith in the Lord or what, what the God has done to change your life or, or the difference that Jesus has made in you? And when I read that, as I was going down through, I was just reading through the book of, of Luke and I was just taking a portion of scripture each day and reading it. And when I got to that portion of scripture, that popped out at me. It's almost like it jumped off of the page. It said she continued you to tell all about him. We need to talk about Jesus. There is so much bad going on in the world. There is so much evil all around us. There is so much stuff that just gives us every reason to be down and depressed and concerned and, and, and to, to be doubtful about how things are going to go. And what we need to do is talk more about Jesus. We need to tell people about it. We need to talk about it. When, when we start to get down, we need to talk about what Jesus has done. Has he done anything good for you? Has he made any change in your life at all? Has he given you anything to be happy about? I, I'm one that I, you all, I, you've heard me say this before, I'm one that looks at the glass half empty. I'm one that sees the problems first, and then I have to go, okay, Lord, you've brought me through this before. Lord, you've helped me when I've had similar circumstances. Lord, you've never failed me. And I have to give myself the pep talk. Well, we need to start giving ourselves the pep talk. And we need to start talking to one another more about Jesus. We need to start telling the world about Jesus. You have friends. You have family members. You have people that you work with. You have loved ones that need to know about Jesus. You've got some enemies that need to know about Jesus, and we need to be telling everybody about Jesus. James called me up the other day. I didn't tell him I was going to use him as an example. He called me up the other day, and he said, how you doing, Brother Allen? And we just got to talking. And he said, I got a friend of mine that I've been talking to.
do about Jesus. And he said, I think the Lord's doing something in this life. And he said, I'm going to keep on working on it. He called me up a few days later, and I said, how's so-and-so doing? He said, you know, he said, I've been talking to him about Jesus. And he said, I think he's going to come to church. And last week, he kept on talking to him about Jesus, and last week he came to church with him and heard about Jesus. And I talked to James, I think it was yesterday, wasn't it, or Friday, and I said, how you doing, James? Because James has been having some health issues. And I said, how you doing, James? And he said, I'm doing okay. And I said, how's so-and-so doing? And he said, you know, he said, uh, I think he enjoyed church. And he said, I've been talking to him, and I think he's going to come back. But he's been talking to him, and he keeps on talking to him. And because he talked to him, he came, and he heard the word. Maybe he didn't accept it right away. Maybe he didn't jump in and say, hey, I'm going to be one of these Christians. But he heard the word. He heard about Jesus. He heard about the birth of Christ. He heard about the gift of God. He heard about all that we celebrate in the Christmas season. And now that's working in his heart. And now the Lord has that that he can move in this man. And, and James ain't quitting. He's going to keep on talking about Jesus. And that's what we need to do, church. Just like Anna. She got excited about the Lord. That's the thing that concerns me. We talk about what we're excited about. We talk about what's important to us. And so if we are not talking about Jesus, that means something's happened. We've lost some excitement. Because I know when I first gave my heart to the Lord, I told everybody about Jesus. I, I mean, people started going the other direction because they said, here comes out and he's going to talk about Jesus. <laughs> and after a while, that excitement kind of wears off. After a while, we get back into the same old, you know, just complaining about what's going on every day and, and talking about the weather and talking about what happened this week in the news and talking about what happened on our favorite show and talking about our hobbies and talking about everything except the one thing that all the world needs to hear about. He is still the most important message. He is still the greatest news story. He is still the most exciting event. He is still the, the greatest thriller that has ever happened. He is still the one that we're looking forward to. He is still the one who's changing lives. And we need to spend our lives talking about Jesus. Anna couldn't quit. It said that she continued to tell all about him. We don't know how long Anna lived. All told is that she was 84 years old at the time this happened. But I imagine she went to her grave talking about Jesus. Saying, I saw him in the flesh. The one that we waited for, I saw him and I met him. And he was just a little baby at the time, but he changed her life and she couldn't stop talking about it. And Jesus changed my life. And I don't ever want to lose that excitement. I don't ever want to lose that message for people. When people are down, I want to tell them that Jesus is their hope. When Jesus, you know, when people are lost, I want to tell them Jesus is the way to be found. When people are hopeless and want to end their life, I want to tell them Jesus is the greatest hope you can ever have. And instead of taking your life, he wants to give you life. We have a message to tell. We've got, got something great to share. And we should not be silent about it. It's more important than who the president is. It's more important than the politics of the day. It's more important than which team is going to the Super Bowl. It's more important than, than who the greatest doctor is or how my health is doing or anything that I can talk about. The thing that I need to mention to everybody more than anything else is Jesus Christ. The Son of God, who came to this earth as a baby, who lived this life as 
as a man who gave his life as a sacrifice, who rose from the grave with power, who went to prepare a place for me and is someday coming back to receive me unto himself and he wants to take you to that place that he's prepared also and he wants you to bring a whole lot of people with him. And so we need to do some talking. And we need to continue to talk. When people get tired of hearing it, we need to talk some more. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, you can tell somebody over and over and over again and they won't want to hear it, but when tragedy comes, they'll know who to talk to. When things start falling apart, they'll know who the answer is. And we need to get the word out. We need to tell everybody. That's what Anna did. She was faithful. She fasted and prayed. And she told everybody about Jesus. Who are you talking to? Do you tell people about the Lord? Do you share your faith with anybody? The scripture says that we ought to be ready at any time to tell anyone about the faith that lives in us. And you say, well, I can't remember all the scriptures, and I don't know how to lead somebody to the Lord, and I don't know how to go through all the process. Do you know how to tell somebody what happened to you? I can tell you about heart surgery, because it happened to me. I can tell you about the scars. I can tell you about the pain. I can tell you about the recovery time. I can tell you about what the procedure is like because it happened to me. Now somebody comes along and never had a heart problem and never had a surgery and never went through the process and they try to tell you what happens. That's difficult for me to, you know, I'd rather hear somebody that uh, there have been times when I was anxious during this process. And I wondered what it was going to be like. And I met people who had been through it before me. I was talking to Leon the other day. You know Leon had open heart surgery? I had a double bypass. Leon had a triple bypass. <laughs> and he was telling me about what he went through and what the recovery was like. And, and this was years and years ago before they had all the types of medications they have now, before they had the surgical procedures they have now and stuff. And it was a whole lot different for him than it was for me. And I appreciated sitting down and just talking to him about the process. A man that attends church here when he's in the area, he, uh, um, he had quadruple bypass just a couple weeks before I did. <laughs> And when I went to visit him in the hospital, he had a big smile on his face, and I said, how you doing? He said, oh, God's been so good to me, and he brought me through this, and wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be, and he got me encouraged before I even went in to have my procedure, because he had been through it. He knew what it was like, and he could tell me what was going on. Well, if I've experienced Jesus, then I can just tell somebody what the Lord's done for me. I can tell them how I was hopeless and he gave me hope. I can tell them how I was lost and he found me and put me on the right path. I can tell them how I didn't feel any love in my life, but Jesus gave me the greatest love of all. And I have felt loved every day since I, since I found him, even when I fail him, I know he loves me. Even when I'm falling on my face, I know that he's not condemning me, but he's lifting me up. And so I can tell others about what Jesus can do because I've experienced it for myself. And I want to tell others. And I hope you want to tell others too. We got another whole year ahead of us. And we always make New Year's resolutions. I've already failed on some of them. But this year, I want to tell more people about Jesus. This year, I want to share hope with people that don't have hope. This, this 
this year I want to give truth to people who are lost in darkness. This year I want to be like Anna and tell everybody about Jesus. How about you? Is there somebody that you can tell? Is there somebody you know that needs to hear the message? Is there somebody that's lost and you can show them the way? Is there somebody that you can talk to about Jesus and you can be faithful in your work for the Lord and you can do something to reach a life for the Lord this year? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you began to use your talents and your abilities and you quit, the, you quit saying, I'm too old or I'm not smart enough or I don't have enough education or, or I'm not talented enough. You quit using all those excuses and you just said, I'm going to use what God has given me and this year I'm going to touch somebody's life for Jesus. And I'm going to spend time fasting, and I'm going to spend time praying, and I'm going to spend time working for the Lord, and I'm going to spend time talking about Jesus, and somebody's life is going to be touched by my life this year. 